Okay, so we are all here and grounded and let go of what came before. And uh, we'll do the Heart Sutra to ground ourselves. So each time we read this, really try and hear different layers of meaning, really try and let it reinforce what you already know. And uh, here we go. Okay. So on Wednesday, you were talking about negating the two extremes from the different tenant schools perspectives and there was that chart. And then um, I gave you time to have like a 20 minute discussion kind of about the semester so far and that content in particular. Are there any highlights that were like particularly intriguing or particularly confusing that you wanted to kind of raise? about uh, what you said about God, it's outside or inside, this one? About what? God? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. What? Whether God is inside or outside. Yeah, that's a good conversation. No, but, but you know, this, if you ask about this. Um, well, what? how do you define God first? <laughs> I just, I just asked if uh, you, you, you mean the discussion that we talk if uh, there is a God and if there is, if there is no God, this one? Um, that was part of the, the conversation. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about why why we refute the, the lower school's idea of partless particles, but also why we refute the idea of a permanent creator in the sense yeah. that some religions talk about God. Yeah, you said yeah. that uh, if there is God, so you, you, you refute God because you said that if there is a God, so there is a, a inherent existence, right? Uh, almost yeah almost we uh, we would say what do you how do you define god right like many people define god as the creator the beginner yeah. the, the one who started everything and we would say there might be a godlike entity the buddhas might be godlike entities in the sense of being omniscient and kind and supportive and helping us in our daily life but we don't call them creators the creation factor for Buddhism is karma. And it doesn't make sense to posit a first moment because that means that it has no cause and it came out of nowhere and that doesn't make sense. So that was the, the thing to talk about a little bit and you don't have to agree with that. That was just kind of the, the premise to start talking around. So yeah, did you have interesting stuff come up with that? Is there a mixture of... Um, I, I don't know. That, I thought that uh, I don't know what is God. I don't know what is God. Something that I don't know what is it. But I think that we have uh, some uh, feeling, um, uh, a feeling of uh, something uh, spiritual. Everyone, At the, sure. Like, uh, like we say in the psychoanalysis, um, the. Uh, idealized uh, so there is a feeling and the, the question is where is uh, um, from where can come this feeling so by the Jewish perspective um, the, this feeling is is a part of of the omniscient God, so that everyone has inside himself. That's the feeling that you have. It's a spiritual feeling, and and there is a continuity uh, after the death that uh, what we call the soul. Mm -hmm. So it's I, I don't know what is soul, but it it. Um, it's uh, like, I think it's uh, a skill uh, reminds 
the the continuity the, that that we we talk about in the Buddhism. Maybe I mean I think this is where this is where Buddhism is is radically different to other religions. You know, there's ways that it's very similar in terms of ethics, um, in terms of you know altruism. There's a lot of ways that Buddhism is similar to other religions. Other religions are very similar to each other in the way that they view God. Maybe not in the way that they view what God does or what He thinks, but um, this idea of an omniscient and omnipotent, so all-powerful as well as all-knowing creator. Buddhism doesn't believe that Buddha was the creator. So we would not say Buddha is God because God has the connotation of a creator, the beginner, one who started it all. And we believe in beginningless time because you need to always posit a cause whenever there's a result. And so for us to say that something came out of nowhere is more strange than to say beginningless time, beginningless mind. Even, even if so God is beginning, be, beginningless? Well, it, we don't believe in the God that other religions believe in. We don't even use the word God, right? Yeah, yeah. But we do, yeah, so. But the, 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 the idea of beginningless is, is uh... It's something that uh, all the the religion and and the Buddhism say. But, but a lot of religions believe that in the beginninglessness is God, and that at some point he, I don't know, got bored or something and decided to make people. You know, <laughs> I don't know what what was the catalyst for God deciding to make <laughs> creations, but but that's not our worldview. And I'm not sure this is the worldview of the, of the Judaism. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So do you believe that there have always been sentient beings besides God? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Yeah, but it's an interesting issue. I mean, the main issue that we're talking about is permanence and impermanence and cause and effect. That's the main thing that we're boiling down to because it underpins why our ethics are the way they are. Yeah. Our ethics are not about a moral issue of good and bad. They're about a strategic issue of what creates happiness and what creates suffering on the basis of understanding reality accurately. So if you do positive constructive actions it will lead to happiness as a natural flow on effect. If there's a creator God who's in charge of all that, then you're doing good in order to justify or placate or live up to his example, or you're doing it for many other reasons, which might also be good reasons. They're just not our reasons. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, I know what you mean, but I'm not sure that uh... Um, there is a very big um, difference between both because uh, because we don't know what is really God, no one. So I think that we project, we project, right? What we think is God. Sure. I, it's just, I guess the, the point I'm making is we don't believe in God, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you believe in, in the mind. Yeah, yeah. The mind is the, is, is the, the part that is spiritual. Well, that's the view of, of other schools of thought. We, we would, to frame the, the, the mind as somehow inherently spiritual, somehow gives it, I don't know, a connotation of inherence that I don't like. So I somehow I'm resisting your term spiritual the mind is neutral, right? It's clarity and awareness. It's clear and knowing. It has the potential for incredible goodness, incredible compassion, right? It always has Buddha potential, but that potential hasn't been actualized. It also has had innate ignorance always, which is why it causes trouble and suffers and hurts itself and others. Right. So to say that the mind is, is spiritual, I don't know. It, it gives a, a, a connotation that sort of like 
I meant, I meant um, Buddha nature. Not yeah, Buddha. Buddha nature, yeah. But when we say Buddha nature, we mean Buddha potential. We don't mean like an already good thing. <laughs> we say something that has the potential for incredible good. And is hopefully going in that direction because those are more in alignment with reality. The good qualities are more in alignment with reality. The reality being interconnection and the lack of duality. <laughs> So, so kind of what I want us to sit with in terms of, you know, if you're coming at it from a secular perspective is why do we do good things? You know, if we don't, if we don't believe in, um, I don't know, a particular religion or we don't believe in a God, what are other reasons to do kind, constructive, beneficial things for yourself and society? And there are a million other reasons besides being a good girl or a good boy right? Or pleasing your creator. Or, you know, there's a lot of other reasons which are logic-based, right? And I'm not saying that a belief in God is not a good thing or a belief in a creator is a bad thing. I think that many, many religions have excellent ethics on the basis of that belief. And that maybe at their most subtle philosophical view, with their most high practitioners, they might all come together and meet to a very common understanding. But the belief of kind of regular everyday people who don't study and don't kind of delve deeply into the essence of their religion, they might oversimplify and say, we do good because good is important and God loves it if we do good. And it can kind of work until things go wrong. And then you feel like God is punishing you or God is trying to teach you a lesson that you're not ready to learn. And all of these other ripple effects can happen if you've oversimplified this worldview and kind of hung on to something permanent as the creative source. So it's up to each of us as an individual what we want to take on board, but it's worth examining. What is it that drives positive behavior? And is it more stable? to rest on a logical reason rather than a faith-based emotional reason. You know, so the logic of cause and effect is you do good things because it all is related to this interconnected, infinitely connected network. What helps you helps others. What helps others helps you. It makes sense to do constructive, beneficial things. Yeah, it makes sense as opposed to then you get stamped with goodness <laughs> and then everyone knows that you're good. You know, it's a different reason. In a sense, because we're interconnected, it's not even a question of good or bad. It's a question of just being interconnected. Yeah. That you can be feeling connected. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So when we're talking about these two extremes from the different views, maybe some of the words made sense and some of them didn't. And there was that chart that I put up and, you know, I'm not sure how well that sat. It's, it's difficult in every language. It's not just the English, like in every language that we have, um, I'll put that chart back. Um, in every language, this division is a little bit complicated because words are kind of inaccurate, you know, ineffective or imprecise but we're basically looking at the highest level of subtlety going to the lowest level of subtlety. And the main thing that I want you guys to think about are what are extremes? What are the extremes that people fall into that separate them from reality, that divorce them from truth, and that lead to more suffering in their life? So we say avoiding the extreme of annihilation and avoiding the extreme of permanence. Annihilation means nihilism or believing nothingness. Permanence, the extreme of permanence is related to eternalism. So not the concept of permanence itself, but eternalism. So I'm gonna unpack those a little bit in a minute. So, so don't worry, I'm gonna go back over it. But when you think in terms of the two extremes, Make sure you're not getting confused and thinking that we're talking about inherent existence and emptiness, right? We're that's, it's another conversation. 
So what in grasping at inherent existence does is give us these two extremes. Emptiness is the lack or the middle way between these two extremes. So the two extremes in everyday life, the kind of push and pull in our life, we kind of go back and forth between believing that um, things are only important if we decide they're important, right? Or everything is important in and of itself, divorced from context, divorced from other people's opinion. These are just important things, right? They kind of go back and forth. Like I make my own reality. I'm a victim of reality, <laughs> right? Things are happening to me. Things are happening from me. We kind of, you know, go like this to make it really simplistic. And when your patients are in front of you and they're saying, blah, blah, blah is wrong in my life. Do you feel that a lot of their negative states of mind are driven by a fundamental problem in their view, their worldview of the way the world is supposed to work? They're holding on to an idea that simply isn't true always. Do you find that to be the case? Like people are supposed to be this way and that is true in a certain context and then they're holding on to it and thinking it should be true in all contexts and then they suffer. Does that, I'm sure that happens, right? With When you're listening, you're like, okay, yep, there's a point that you're making, but you're making it too broad or too permanent. Can you, can you sort of frame the mistaken thinking of your patients in that way, or does that not make sense to frame it in that way? So yeah, anyway, the word of the day is extremes. Yeah, I want you to look at extremes. We've been looking at levels of ignorance, kind of up, you know, top to bottom. <laughs> now we're looking at ignorance kind of side to side. <laughs> Yeah, but basically different ways of holding on to the wrong idea. Okay, so I'll go into it a little more um, and I'll go through a PowerPoint and then I'll stop it and my little head will pop up again and you can ask questions if you have them. Um, I won't be able to see you while I have the PowerPoint up. So um, if you interrupt me, you have to be loud. <laughs> okay, all right, so here we go. So avoiding extremes means we need to review provisional and interpretive, which was the discussion on the four reliances that we did at your very first semester. And then we need to negate or say it's wrong or not true about permanence, the extreme of permanence, nihilism and the lower tenant schools. So we'll just see how far we go, just slowly, slowly. Um, in your text on um, page 52 or on page 29 of the PDF, it talks about this verse nine in a praise to dependent arising. And the heading is how those who see emptiness and dependent arising as contradictory cannot comprehend or understand the path devoid of extremes. So if you think that emptiness and dependent arising are contradicting each other, you're never going to resolve the understanding of reality. So emptiness and dependent arising aren't the same thing, but they aren't contradictory either. They're two views of reality. So the verse says, O oh benefactor, for the sake of benefiting beings, you bestowed this teaching the definitive unequaled reason for emptiness, which is the heart of the teachings. So the reason for emptiness is dependent arising. You know, please have that as a mantra in your mind. Even if you don't agree or understand yet, keep hearing emptiness is empty because it dependently arises. Dependent arising is the reason for emptiness. And if you keep sitting with that, it will become clear over time. So in the verse, it says the definitive unequaled reason for emptiness. We have to unpack this word definitive. So this is where we have the four reliances that we talked about in semester one, how to listen, 
and how to practice the Dharma. And Shakyamuni Buddha said in um, the Sutra of Dense Array or the Array of Stock Sutra, O bhikshus and wise men, just as a goldsmith would test his gold by burning, cutting and rubbing it, so you must examine my words and then only accept them, not merely out of reverence for me. Which means at the beginning, we look at reliance on the teachings, not just the teacher. Then reliance on the meaning, not just the words that express it. Then reliance on the definitive meaning, not the provisional meaning, and reliance on the transcendent wisdom of deep experience, not only intellectual knowledge. So number three is what's important right now. Number three, reliance on the definitive meaning, not the provisional meaning. Definitive in the middle way consequence school, the subtlest view, definitive means emptiness, means ultimate truth. Provisional means relative truth, things that need to be interpreted. Okay, so this is a really important distinction in the middle way consequence school, that to say something is provisional basically means it's only true in a certain context. And they give an example, which I think is very interesting from the time of the Buddha, where there was a prince of some small kingdom who was very much wanting to be king. And so he killed his mother and father. And then he killed, because he killed his mother and father, suddenly he had grief and he thought, what have I done? You know, I wanted to be king, but I just killed my parents. I feel horrible. I feel crazy. I should kill myself. And he was so distraught and he had so much emotion that uh, people said, wait, wait, wait. Let's bring you to the Buddha and see what he has to say. And so he was crazy and disturbed and full of grief. And the Buddha said to him, it's okay, it's okay. Mother and father are to be killed, <laughs> right? And the prince, because he had such trust in the Buddha, relaxed, even though he didn't understand really what he meant. He thought, okay, the Buddha said mother and father are to be killed. <sighs> okay. And once he relaxed, the Buddha said, by mother and father, I mean karma and disturbing emotions. Karma and disturbing emotions are to be killed. And that is what your grief and your agitation and your disturbing emotions were born from. So in that sense, karma and disturbing emotions are like your mother and your father, and those need to be killed. But he only said that once the disciple, the prince, had enough mental space to hear it. If he had said right off the bat, karma and disturbing emotions are to be destroyed, the prince wouldn't have any space to hear that. He was too distressed. Yeah? So the provisional meaning, <laughs> the interpretive meaning, was mother and father are to be killed. The deeper meaning was karma and disturbing emotions are to be destroyed. The definitive meaning is, and all of that is empty of inherent existence. Right? So this is our recipe for preventing fundamentalism. These four reliances, particularly this one on provisional and interpretive. Because, you know, Judaism and Buddhism both have commentaries and commentaries and commentaries about the main teachings, don't they? There's, you know, a million books written about what this one text means or this one line. People all have their opinions about what something means. And the Buddha says, it's good, you should do that. You should argue about it, you should debate about it. But at the end of the day, the thing that will be consistently true, that will always be true, is that everything is empty of inherent existence. So all of the elaborations, all of the stories, all of the opinions on top are provisional. They need to be interpreted or they need to be looked at within the context of their time. Does that make sense? It prevents you from getting so tight about your beliefs 
that you think that they are so true that you must fight to defend them or push other people to believe them or feel superior for having them. You know, all of the things that start wars are about holding on to inherently existent ideas of your beliefs. And in Buddhism, we say this, this, and this are true, but only within a certain context and not from their own side, not all by themselves. But just because something is a relative truth and relatively true, doesn't mean it's not still useful and that we need to operate within it while we're still living in a relative appearance way. So it's like, have your opinions, but have them lightly know that they lack inherence. So this idea of provisional and definitive, does it make sense? Rely on the definitive, not the provisional? This third layer? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I can't quite hear you, I'm sorry. Could you come closer to the mic? We don't understand what is the provisional level, how to, uh, <laughs> no, we are trying to understand it. We can't dispute it, okay. and why, uh, you can, why did you say that the uh, karma and the spirit and emotion are to be killed by black karma only, you referred to? By what? Karma. Karma and disturbing emotions are to be destroyed. And then you said buy something and I couldn't hear you. Uh, did you mean only black karma? Well, even, even white karma, even positive karma is reinforced by grasping at inherent existence. So eventually we want to be going beyond karma. You know, it's like good karma is as good as we can do right now. So keep doing it. It's excellent, but it's still not perfect because it's tainted by grasping at inherent existence. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, you might do a good thing. You might give food to the poor, but you're holding on to the idea that that's inherently good. They inherently need it. They should inherently appreciate it. And you're inherently good for doing it, which is too simplistic and not always true. Right. But it's still good. And you should still give food to the poor. You know, so even positive karma is not perfect. So even positive karma, we want to go beyond. Um, when the Buddha is saying, you know, destroy karma and disturbing emotions, he's saying, get out of samsara. Get out of samsara. Is there anything outside karma? Yeah, because karma is driven by grasping at inherent existence. That first link ignorance in the 12 links. So once you cut that, you create less and less contaminated karma until you're not creating any negative karma whatsoever. So it's really only a Buddha that has like, quote, purified karma or has gone beyond karma. Yeah. I don't understand how it can be beyond karma. It's not always. If there so is karma, has no. Karma in general refers to like oh. mental intention in general, you know, as well as the actions of speech and body that flow from it generally. And for all ordinary beings that has grasping at inherent existence built right in. Once you're purified and you've realized emptiness, you're not creating as contaminated karma until you're a Buddha and you're not creating contaminated karma at all. And that's a, a way of phrasing it is to say a Buddha has gone beyond karma why? Even no. though, even though, listen, even though Buddhas have intention, it's not intention built on grasping at inherent existence, okay. right? So it's, the issue is grasping at inherent existence, contaminating intention. So when we say karma, you know, we're, we're talking about usually karma contaminated by grasping at inherent existence. To say go beyond karma, we're saying go beyond actions driven by karma and disturbing emotions yeah so it's a subtle distinction if if it makes more sense to you to think buddhas create karma they just only create pure karma you can think that that's okay some of the the divisions and divisions are philosophical points that scholars argue about and aren't that big a deal yeah 
it just sounds like when you say beyond karma, it sounds that there is um, there is something beyond cause and fun and results. Yeah, no, and we're not saying that. We're we're saying that there is there are actions that can happen that don't have to be driven by grasping at inherent existence. It's just that we've never experienced that and we've never done that. So, so far, all of our actions have been contaminated from beginningless time because we've always had this grasping at inherent existence. So when you talk about imprints, when you talk about imprints, what is it? Imprints or emptiness? Imprints. Uh-huh, yep. What is it? It contains karma, potential, so imprints and seeds, yeah, there's, there's a, like a subtle distinction between karmic imprints and karmic seeds. And sometimes they're conflated to mean the same thing when we're just speaking roughly. But if you're to make a precise division, what's the difference between a seed, a karmic seed and a karmic imprint? The karmic seed is the substantial cause for experience. The imprint is like the habit of that that remains or the appearances from that that remain. So you could purify your negative karma, but still have an imprint of it until you've realized emptiness directly. And we'll have all of these imprints until we're like on the path of meditation near the end. Those imprints are what prevent us from omniscience. So once you've realized emptiness directly, you start to really purify huge amounts of karmic seeds, but things still appear to you as inherently existent. You just don't believe it in the same way. Just as we're training ourselves to not believe it now, once we've realized emptiness, we'll have very little trouble not believing the appearance. So we'll see someone and we'll think, oh, there's a good person who I love, but immediately we'll know no inherently existent good person from their own side. We won't have to stop and remember it. It will just come naturally. But they'll still look that way to our mind for a moment because of imprints. So the kind of seventh, eighth, and ninth part of the path of meditation is where you're clearing all of the obstructions to omniscience, what are called knowledge obscurations. When you clear all those imprints, that's when you're actually a Buddha, because it's only a Buddha that can see relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously at the same time. For someone who's realized emptiness, they can see reality directly, but only when they're in meditation when they're out of meditation, they still have enough imprints where things still have that appearance or that seeming of inherence to them. They just don't believe it as much. So seeds give you experience. Imprints give you appearances. Does that help? But sometimes colloquially in Buddhism, we'll say, oh, it's from imprints, it's from imprints, usually meaning habit. Yeah, usually, you know, if we're just kind of speaking in general, imprints relate to karmic habits or like predispositions, personality traits, you know, or a, an affinity for something that's related to imprints. Yeah. So karma is the reason we uh, receive uh, inherent existence. No, ignorance is the reason we perceive inherent existence. Karma is what we do because of that. Yeah, so because we have ignorance, then we create actions on the basis of our ignorance. So we're confused about reality first, then we do actions of body, speech, and mind from a confused place. From that confused place, we hurt ourselves and we hurt other people because we don't understand reality. Right. But you didn't just now say that karma is also somewhat responsible for this uh, illusion of ignorance. It's the imprint of ignorance, right? So you have your initial ignorance, and then you have all these actions under the influence of ignorance, and they reinforce the ignorance. 
right? So your imprints reinforce the initial problem. You had the initial problem, you know, from beginningless time, you had innate ignorance, then you did actions because of it. And as time goes by, those actions keep making sense because you keep having ignorance. And then you reinforce your ignorance through your karmic seeds and karmic imprints, right? You're reinforcing the problem every day of your life by believing that things are just as they appear. Yeah, your belief reinforces your belief, which all came from the kind of core problematic thing. So imprints, imprints didn't give you your first appearance, but they reinforce it. Yeah, have you not talked about this before? I feel like this is a, no, it's okay. We have to go over it again and again, but remember the analogy of like garlic in the bag, like the seeds are like the garlic and then you take the garlic out, but it still smells like garlic. That's like the imprints. Yeah, remember that one? Anyway, we're gonna have a whole karma day coming up soon. So karma's coming, coming up, okay? We're just gonna go back to extremes though, cause it's really important to understand the two extremes. Okay. So this four reliances is the recipe to prevent fundamentalism. Okay. <laughs> it's good and important. Definitive means emptiness, ultimate truth. Provisional means relative truth needs to be interpreted, needs more information, is only true within a context. Okay. So continuing on with the text, the commentary says, in saying, oh benefactor, for the sake of benefiting beings, you bestowed this teaching. Lama Tsongkhapa expresses that the reason the Buddha taught this particular teaching on dependent arising and emptiness was in order to benefit all living beings in the six realms of existence. So emptiness was true, dependent arising was true before the Buddha taught it. He taught it because he wanted to help us get out of this mess. It's not a truth he created, it's a truth he revealed. Yeah, you with me? Okay. <laughs> so because dependent arising is said to be the highest proof of emptiness, it is often given the name king of reasons. Why is it given that name? In the past, when people lived in fiefdoms, which are like tiny kingdoms, where the king was the supreme ruler, it was he who made all the decisions about whether something was true or not true, right or not right. When something needed to be decided, people, sought, <clears throat> people brought their cases before the king and the king was the final arbiter or the person who decided. In the same way, if it comes down to making a decision between inherent existence or no inherent existence, true existence or no true existence, the final arbiter or decider of that decision is dependent arising. Dependent arising is what finally declares whether something is inherently existent or non-inherently existent, whether something is truly existent or non-truly existent. And so just, you know, keep sitting with it. The reasoning that all other lines of reason are not called king of reasons is that they are not the final decider, right? They're not like a complete picture. They help, but they're not the final decision maker. In applying these other lines of reasoning, often they do not clearly rule out one or more of the two extreme views of permanence and nihilism. The teaching on dependent arising, however, clearly destroys the wrong view of permanence and the wrong view of nihilism. The way it accomplishes this can be seen through merely looking at the words dependent arising as discussed earlier by showing that things are dependent and that they arise. Let's again examine this reasoning. Okay, so this is review. So dependent, ten in Tibetan, indicates that things exist in dependence on other factors. Those factors could be causes and conditions 
for impermanent phenomena, the parts and the whole for all phenomena, and independence on being posited through the process of labeling, so merely imputed designation, also referring to all phenomena. Arising, drell in Tibetan, corresponds to, ooh, excuse me, if something is an arising, this means it arises due to its relationship with something else. If the proper causes and conditions, the parts in the process of be being merely labeled all come together, then a phenomena can arise, right? So dependent and arising, the two parts of the phrase each have their significance to help us understand what makes things, what creates things, how it is we come to understand things and why they don't exist alone or independently. So we're just reviewing permanence, right? The concept of permanence. This is permanence as a general term. The, the technical definition is the common locus between phenomena and being non-momentary, which just means static, right? Not changing. So for something to be permanent, it's not necessarily eternal, although some things might be. It's not produced and doesn't change. It's not dependent on causes and conditions, but it does depend on parts, basis, and imputation. Examples of permanent things are uncompounded space and emptiness itself. So there are permanent things. The discussion of the two extremes is talking about something different. The discussion of the two extremes is talking about the extreme of permanence, not permanence as a general concept. Okay. Yep. So first we're going to look at nihilism, then we're going to look at permanence. This is just dictionary definition, okay? And there's Hebrew there, hopefully that helps. Yes. So nihilism or annihilation, these mean the same thing. This means complete destruction or obliteration, total defeat or destruction. It basically means to cancel out or to say isn't there. Okay, that it's non-existent. Okay, and then the extreme of permanence refers to eternalism. And saying that something is dependent negates or cancels the idea that it could exist under its own power. Okay. So annihilation and nihilism mean the same thing and are used interchangeably. Permanence and eternalism. Permanence is referring to the extreme of permanence, not the general idea of permanence, which does exist in some cases. The extreme of permanence is referring to eternalism. Okay, so just get those two clear. Those are the Those are the two extremes, okay? They are the two ways things do not exist. They do not exist in this way. They do not exist in that way. There are two sides of not true at all, even conventionally, 100% not true, neither of them. But they are ways of thinking that our ignorance will make us fall into, yeah? And if we fall into either extreme, we'll get lost. We'll get lost in lack of ethics, we'll get lost in despair, we'll get lost in suffering or hedonism, we'll get lost in a million different things. But because of our ignorance, we kind of go back and forth between these two extremes. So we're just gonna try and understand them a little bit more. And I really recommend that you read the text itself really slowly at home and just sit with it and see what resonates. But, um, you know, gently, gently. Okay, so <coughs> negating the extreme of permanence, annihilation. So as, as I said before, 
saying that something dependent negates the idea that it could exist under its own power. Take, for example, something dependent on causes and conditions to come about. Without those causes and conditions, such a thing could not exist. And therefore, it does not exist <coughs> under its own power. So under its own power means by itself. Thus, to say something is dependent negates completely the possibility that something could be independent or come into existence under its own power. So when you look at something like that, it's saying the same thing in like three different ways. It's not saying three different things. Okay, so sometimes I worry that you guys get overwhelmed and think that many, many things are being said. The same thing is being said, just from slightly different angles to help you understand. So if you miss one line, let it go and listen for the next line and probably one of the lines will make sense. You know, so, so just, you know, kind of like relax the mind and just try and hear things openly and go, okay, that doesn't make sense. What's the next line? <laughs> oh, okay, that sort of makes sense. Okay. And once something makes sense, ask yourself, do I agree or disagree? If I agree, what's the implication in my life and my practice? But don't jump to what's the implication in my life and my practice or why is this important before you've actually understood the point, <laughs> okay? So if you don't understand the point, keep trying to understand the point and then see how it applies. It, it's difficult if you're a very experiential sort of learner because you want to have an experience first and an understanding you know, will come over time. In Buddhism, you kind of have to understand the premise before you can go further with it. And it, it just takes a little bit of patience. Okay, so we'll just have a couple more and then call it a day. So the three understandings of dependence, those three levels that we talked about, things being dependent on causes and conditions, on parts and the whole, on being merely labeled by mind, negate or cancel the idea that things could exist under their own power. So the three levels of dependent arising that we've been talking about negate permanence, the extreme of permanence, the extreme of internalism. Yeah, it cancels that. So in this way, the idea that things are dependent negates the extreme view of permanence. This is directly from the commentary. So what you're trying to do is to see the way that, okay, those three levels of dependency that we talk about, those are logical reasons to help us understand that things can't exist by themselves. Those are just, you know, it's not hard. Yeah, just kind of, you know, give yourself some space and be like, oh yeah, okay. Because if things existed under their own power, they wouldn't depend on anything else. And it's obvious that they do. So you let it go. What does that mean for you in your life? That means your opinions can change with new information. That means your impressions of people can shift into a place of compassion. Lots of really important everyday life ramifications flow on from this understanding, which this is just kind of a basic logical proof. So keep coming back to it till it makes sense. Yeah. So then the idea that things arise negates the other extreme view, nihilism. Yeah, so dependent negates, uh, negates eternalism. Arise negates nihilism. So here's the um, definition of nihilism just from the dictionary to help kind of get your head around it. And hopefully that Hebrew makes sense. I just copy and pasted from my friend. <laughs> so hopefully I didn't miss any characters. But nihilism is a noun that means a rejection of all principles, the belief that life is meaningless. You know, in a philosophical context, the extreme skepticism, maintaining that nothing in the world has real existence. So annihilation that I described before and nihilism, 
you know, these two, these are really problematic and people with extreme depression can fall into this, but also very kind of what we would call colloquially evil people also can fall into this. So this is a huge extreme and it can be driven by the innate ignorance. So it's important to kind of find logical proofs to get ourselves out of it, but we have to call it a day. So, um, <laughs> so that's it for today. Um, that wasn't quite as much as I wanted to get through. We don't have to rush it, but um, I think that if you can just kind of gradually over time, look at the text, think about it deeply, look at the text, think about it deeply, keep looking at the three levels of dependent arising, that particular teaching is gonna really come in handy um, and see how it goes. This is um, kind of really profound, really important key philosophical issues in Buddhism. And so if they don't make sense, you know, do keep asking questions, don't be shy, okay? And um, we'll just take a minute to um, silently dedicate to ourselves because we don't have time to do the whole prayer. So if you wanna just kind of put your pens down and sit quietly for a second and just give it a chance to digest. And through the power of this class, may we understand our own extremes and find ways to cancel or negate them, preventing suffering, preventing harm. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks guys.